So my topic is the extremely complicated Riemann sum. So the point of a Riemann sum is to approximate the area under a curve, which is also known as the integral. And the most common ways for doing this are the rectangular approximation method, also known as the RAM, and then the trapezoidal approximation method, which I don't think is known as the TAM, but I'm, I like to call it that. So the rectangular approximation method uses, as you might imagine, rectangles, which is this shape right here. And to approximate the sum, what you're going to do is add up the area of just a series of rectangles. So to get started, let's draw a simple graph here. All right, now we have some function that looks like this. We need to divide this into rectangles. So let's make let's make five rectangles. So these are our five intervals. They're also called partitions. Now let's take any one of these partitions and call it I. I is the name of this this interval right here. So inside I, we need to draw a rectangle. So let's say that rectangle goes up to right there. And this point where it intersects our curve, right here, we're going to call that point C. So what we're going to do to approximate the area of this curve is add up a bunch of these areas. So it makes sense that we can use summation notation to write this. So we're going to start at interval 1. And we have 5 intervals here, so we're going to go up to 5. So for each of the rectangles, we want to find the area. And of course, we know that area is equal to base times height. Now in the context of this graph, your height your height is the value of this function at point C, and your base is the change in x on this interval. So to rewrite this, let's go ahead and put in our height, which is the value of the function at point C. And C, it's important to note, is inside interval I. And we're going to multiply this by the change in x in interval I again. So this is the basic notation for your generic Riemann sum. Now, what makes each approximation method unique is the location of C within the interval. So we're going to discuss each method. Um, you've all heard of at least three methods, but today we're going to talk about five different methods. So let's go ahead and get rid of all of this. So we're going to need some graphs. And these graphs are going to show positive and negative values. So we're going to need five of these. So for the right Riemann sum, this point C is going to be at the rightmost part of every rectangle. And remember here for the negative values that your height is negative, so technically you're subtracting from your sum. And for the left Riemann sum, point C is at the leftmost part of every rectangle. And 
for the middle. Point C is in the middle of every rectangle. Hopefully you're catching on to the uh, trend here. Now these these are the two you may not have heard of. First is the upper Riemann sum. For the upper Riemann sum, point C is always just at the highest point in the integral, wherever that may be. So there's the highest, there we go. And then here on the negative side, we still we're still looking at the highest value. So that's going to be the least negative value kind of confusing. Might trip you up. And then we have the opposite of that, which is the lower Riemann sum. And on this one, you're always going to go to the lowest value in the interval. And again, when we come over to the negative side, it's still the lowest number. So that's now going to be the most negative number. So there are the five rectangular methods. And you know, while we're here, we might as well go ahead and cover the trapezoidal method. So we need one more graph here. So for the trapezoidal approximation method, you need to remember the formula for the area of a trapezoid, which is 1 over 2 base 1 plus base 2 times your height. So and your bases are always just going to be the value of the function at the interval. And then to make your trapezoid, you just connect these. I don't mean to confuse you here, because this is not the formula for the trapezoidal method. But I just thought it'd be nice to show that right here. So what you're going to need to understand for the AP exam is how these under or over approximate the integral. So for the left and right Riemann sums, it's based on the first derivative. As you can see, if the first derivative is positive and you're increasing, the right Riemann sum is going to overestimate and the left will underestimate. And then it's flipped for when the derivative is negative and the right will underestimate where the left overestimates. And then with the trapezoidal method, it's actually based on the concavity of the function, the second derivative. Here, when it's concave down, you're going to be underestimating. And unfortunately, I didn't draw it, but if you, were, if you were concave up over here, you can see that your trapezoids would be overestimating. And who knows if it'll come up on the AP exam, but the upper Riemann sum will always over-approximate the area, and the lower Riemann sum will always under-approximate the area. So rather than memorize all these rules, your best bet on those questions is really just to draw a quick sketch of your function and then it should be pretty easy to see, you know, how a right Riemann sum would approximate or the trapezoid would approximate. I mean, that's your best bet. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of all of this stuff. Now, the other thing the AP exam will ask you to do is calculate the Riemann sum based on a table of values. So for the right Riemann sum, it's easiest just to start at the right end of the table and say this number is your height, and the difference between these two is your base. And you do that going down the line. Here's your height, difference is the base. Here's your height, difference is the base. Here's your height, difference is the base. And then for the left Riemann sum, it's just the inverse of that. So you start at the left and you say here's your height, and the difference is your base, height, base, height, base, height, base. 
So the middle sum is a little different because you can't use a standard interval like 1 to 2 because you do not have the midpoint value. So what you need to do on these is double the size of your rectangles. This way you'll have the middle value to use for the height. So you'd use 7 times the change in x. So the second rectangle will go from 3 to 5 and its height will be the midpoint, which is 6. Now the trapezoid is a little different because you're going to be taking two bases and finding the average of them times 1 half and then multiplying that by your height, which is now the difference in x. And then you do that going down the line. But I'm sure you can figure all that out. The only thing that might trip you up on the AP exam is the writers like to use intervals like 1, 2, 3, 14, 75. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but people like to assume that the interval is the same every time, and then they throw in some strange interval. So just make sure you're using the correct value for the base. Well, that took way longer than it should have, so let's get back to the summation notation. Now, the ultimate goal of the Riemann sum is to estimate the area of a curve. And with only five intervals, or if we're using pretty big rectangles, we're going to get a pretty uh, rough approximation. So it makes sense that if we would use smaller rectangles, we're going to get a much more accurate approximation. And ideally, with the most accurate Riemann sum possible, the base of these rectangles, or the change in x, is going to be infinitely small. So essentially what you have is an infinite number of rectangles. So the number on top here is just the total number of intervals. In our past example, it was 5. But in just the basic formula, you have n intervals. So in this case, when the change in x is getting smaller and smaller, the number of intervals you have is approaching infinity. So we can write this as a limit, as n approaches infinity. This is a pretty uh, profound little formula we've come up with here, because this, as accurately as possible, determines the area under a curve. And guess what? We've actually seen another notation for this exact same formula, and it looks something like this. And you can see the parallels here. The infinitely small change in x correlates with the dx, and the value of the function at c correlates with just the value of the function at x. With the uh, previous five methods, we said that c was at a particular place in the interval, and that's what made each sum unique. But with the infinite sum, as it turns out, it does not matter at all where c is. c can be at the right of every interval, it can be at the left, it can be at a totally random point in every interval. No matter where it is, because n is approaching infinity, the value of this sum will infinitely approach the true value of the area under the curve. So there you go. You know, it took 11 minutes of explaining Riemann sums to finally get to this point where you can say an integral can be written as a Riemann sum. So just to try a random example, let's say you have the function 3x squared plus 5x. We can write the area under this curve as simply the integral of 3x squared plus 5x dx or we can write it in this new notation now what if we didn't want the entire area what if we just wanted the area from 0 to 1 of this function. 
So now we can say that the width in x is not just delta x. We can say that it is actually the width of our interval, which is 1, divided by n, which is the number of intervals. Now you may be wondering why this is important. Why would we ever want this to solve a definite integral when we know how to integrate this just fine? And well, the thing is, before calculus existed, before we knew how to write the area of a function in this way and integrate, this notation is all there was. I mean, this was the only logical way there was to calculate the area under a curve. And to actually solve this formula and get the same value as we would just by integrating this function, it takes um, a lot of hard work and complex math. And um, quite frankly, I don't think there's any reason to do it now that we have calculus and we have these great shortcuts. So hopefully I've covered everything uh, Coach Lowe wants me to and everything that you'll ever come across on the AP exam. So that's Riemann sums.